Hi, I'm Professor Goins, and welcome to the Math Professor's YouTube channel. If you find the content useful, please consider liking, commenting, and sharing on our videos, and also please give us a subscribe. We're a very small channel, and we would love the chance to grow, so any interaction you can provide with our, our videos really will help us out a lot. Um, by the way, I've been doing a lot of calculus videos lately, partially because I'm currently teaching the calculus sequence. And so a lot of my videos are focused on either Calc 1, 2, or 3, and that'll probably happen or continue for a while at this point, but I will eventually get to, you know, algebra and statistics and abstract algebra and all these other courses. So we will have a lot of content on our channel. It's just lately we're doing a lot of calculus-related topics. Speaking of which, let's do a calculus-related topic. Um, immigration by partial fractions, part two. I'm assuming at this point you've watched part one just to kind of get an idea of where we're going with this little series of um, videos on integration by partial fractions. Here's where part two picks up. We're looking at an integral where the integrand is a proper rational function. Remember, that's the ratio of polynomials where the degree on the bottom is larger. Uh, and more specifically, where the denominator consists of all linear factors, some of which are repeated. For example, this would be an expression right here where it's a proper rational function. The degree at the top is 1, degree at the bottom is 3. I've got all linear factors, and notice x plus 1 is repeated. I've got x plus 1 squared. Repeated means if I was to write this out without exponents, I would have one factor appear more than once. Okay. Well, before we get into analyzing this expression right here, let's take a look at the following addition of fractions. 1 half plus 5 twelfths. And I want to kind of go through the details and then we're going to make an analogy with the one up top. First and foremost, if I wanted to add those two, I'd need to find a common denominator. To do that, we're going to find the least common multiple of the two denominators, right? What I have to do is, or what I'm going to do, is I'm going to decompose 12 as its prime factorization. 12, of course, is 4 times 3 and 4 is 2 squared. Therefore, 1 half plus 5 twelfths would be the same thing as 1 half plus 5 over 2 squared times 3. Now, commons and least common multiple, of course, of between these two would be a 12. Um, I take a look back down here where I've got the prime factorization. What I need is I need to have another factor of 2. So I've got a square on this one, so I put that in red, different colors, to show you what factors I'm adding in. I also need a factor of 3. To keep it balanced, of course, I need to put a factor of 2 and a 3 on top. And then, at this point, they both have the common denominator of 12, so we can add, of course, the numerators. Now, <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to compare that with this expression up here. Now, what I want to do is I want to decompose this into simpler fractional expressions, or rational expressions. And the question is, what denominators could we have had? If I was to add up a variety of terms here, like simpler fractions, what denominators could I have possibly had? Well, I could have certainly had an x plus 1. For example, I could have had, if I want to add up something to get 12 in the denominator, I could have had a factor of 2. could have also had a factor of 12. Uh, but when we, that would be actually at least common multiple, so I want to, I want to break it down more simply than 12. I could have had a factor, a denominator of 2, I could have had a denominator of 4, I could have had a denominator of 3. Basically, what are all the different components that would lead to this as a least common multiple? Same thing here. What denominators would I have had to create this expression as a least common multiple? Well, I could have had an x plus 1, I could have had an x plus 1 squared, or I could have had an x minus 3. Any other denominator, for example, if I was to have like an x plus 4, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe there was an x plus 4 that, I, that added up. But then when I find the least common multiple of these, I would have an x plus 4 in the denominator. Of course, I don't here, so therefore, that expression wouldn't make any sense. Same thing with any other linear denominator that's not one of those three. Now, what I don't know is what, what was on top. So I'll leave this as a... B, and C. And just like in part one, the goal is 
is to go from this generic, uh, or this, this expression here to the generic expansion. Let's put a plus in between here, plus and plus. How do I go from this generic expansion and solve for the coefficients? Well, what we did was we started by clearing the fraction. So again, if I think of this equal to this as an equation, I will multiply by the original denominator x plus 1 squared times x minus 3. Sorry, that's a little smaller uh, on the board than I was anticipating, so hopefully you can read that. This right here is just this denominator. I'll distribute that all through the equation, and we get what we call the coefficient equation. All right, so I go ahead and I distribute that. Of course, on the left-hand side, the denominator cancels, giving me x minus 2. On the other side, when I multiply, distribute to the a term, I get one factor of x plus 1 would cancel, giving me a, x plus 1, and then x minus 3. When I multiply by the b term, the x plus 1 squared will cancel, giving me b times x minus 3. And then when I multiply by the c term, the x minus 3 cancels, giving c times x plus 1 squared. Again, using the same terminology from the part one video, this right here is called my generic expansion. It's what are the possible fractions I could have had in order to add up to obtain this. And this right here, after I clear the fractions, we refer to this as the coefficient equation. Remember, the coefficient equation is so named because it's the equation from which we will generate the coefficients. Well, if this is supposed to work for every x value, and yes, I'm ignoring the domain restriction, plugging in minus 1 and 3 up here. Um, if this works for every x value, then let's plug in some convenient x values. Convenient x values would be ones for which certain terms would be zeroed out. For example, a 3 and a negative 1. Again, we're ignoring the domain restriction up here. Let's plug some of those values in, or plug both of those values in. First and foremost, let's start with let x equal to 3. <clears throat> Plug in x equal to 3. In this equation, I'm going to get 3 minus 1, which is 1. On the other side, I'm going to get a times 0 plus b times 0 plus c times well, 3 and 1 is 4. 4 squared would be 16. Therefore, c is 1 16th. Let's choose our other convenient value. Let x equal negative 1. Plug in negative 1 everywhere where you see an x. Over here, I've got negative 1 minus 2, which would be negative 3. Over here, I get a times 0 plus b times negative 1 minus 3, which would be negative 4, plus c times 0. Therefore, since that's 0 and that's 0, divide both sides by negative 4, I get b is equal to 3 quarters. All right, notice that my convenient values for x both eliminate the a term. Um, I'm able to generate b and c using those convenient values, but not the a value. So here's what I'm going to do. Since I know the value of b, I know the value of c, and I can plug in anything for x, let's choose an x value that does not zero this out. Because let's, for example, say I plug in 0. Well, then let's go through this whole equation. If I plug in 0, then this would be a constant. Everything after the a would be a constant. b is a constant. That would be a constant. That's a constant. That's a, so everything is a constant except for a, which means I can then solve for it. <clears throat> what I usually then do is choose an x value. Once again, any x value would work. You want to plug in the 11th root of pi over 19,424, 
go for it. But I'm generally going to pick the integer closest to zero. For example, let's choose x equal to zero. And more specifically, I'm going to choose the x value that is closest to zero and which does not make this a term zero. <clears throat> All right, plugging in x equal to zero, we get the following. Zero minus two would be negative two equal to a times one times negative three would be negative three plus B. Again, I know B and C, but I'm going to leave those as written here as B and C until the very end, just to kind of keep it a little bit cleaner. B, and then 0 minus 3, so that would be negative 3, plus C times 0 plus 1, which is 1. 1 squared is 1. And then I get negative, or I get A would be negative 2 plus 3d minus c divided by negative 3. So again, add this to the other side, subtract this, divide that by negative 3, and then I've got some fraction work to do, which I don't have a calculator with me, so I'll just run through that on the board. then equal to negative 2 plus 3b, so plus 3, the b value is 3 quarters, minus c, minus 1 16th, all divided by negative 3. Again, at home, you know, you're just going to take that, you're just going to plug it into your calculator, and you can use the frac button and and, and to save some time. Again, since I didn't, don't have a calculator, I didn't prepare this example ahead of time, let's just go ahead and run through it. I would have this negative one-third I can bring out front. Common denominator would be 16. Multiply bottom by 16, multiply the top by 16, giving me minus 32. This one would give me 9 times, well, I need the bottom to be 16, so I have to multiply the top by top and bottom by 4 minus 1 16th, negative 1 third. So then again, 9 and 4 would be positive 36. Negative 32 plus 36 would be 4. 4 minus 1 is 3, giving me 3 over 16. 3's cancel, and I get negative 1 16th. So now I have my A, B, and C values for my generic expansion. And again, notice that this expression here looks challenging to integrate, and these terms are all pretty simple. Let's wrap up this example by saying, all right, well, suppose I wanted to integrate this. So now, suppose I wanted to integrate x minus 2 over x plus 1 squared times x minus 3. And again, let's, let's suppose that we were starting with this right here. This is the beginning of our example, and I said I wanted you to integrate that. What I would do is I would go through the preceding algebra, and I would find my generic expansion, then I would find all my coefficients, 
And then what I would do finally is I would replace this integrand right here with this generic expansion replacing A, B, and C with the coefficients we found. And that would give me the following, negative 1 16th, oops, uh, negative 1 sixth. negative 1 16th over x plus 1 plus b over x plus 1 squared, in other words, 3 quarters over x plus 1 squared plus c over x minus 3, c was 1 16th. Sorry about that. So I still didn't dry it well enough, but that's x minus 3 and then dx. Now let's integrate each of those terms. One thing before I integrate x plus 1 squared, I'll rewrite that term so that it looks easy, so it's more familiar to integrate. Uh, I would have integral negative 1 over 16 x plus 1 plus 3 quarters times x plus 1 to the negative 2 and then plus 1 16th x minus 3. Okay. So now for the final answer. This one would be a natural log. I get negative 1 over 16. Natural log x plus 1 plus 3 quarters. Since this exponent is not negative 1, we use the power rule on it, meaning I add 1 to the exponent, divide by the increased exponent. So the power rule for antiderivatives. Last term plus 1 16th natural log x minus 3 and then plus c. <clears throat> you can then of course clean this up and write this negative here and then I can flip this to the bottom and make that 1 over x plus 1. Um, so you can go ahead and simplify that. But there would be your answer for the integral. <clears throat> and the same process would apply if this was a higher power. If this was x plus 1 to the third then I would have an x plus 1, an x plus 1 squared, an x plus 1 cubed, and then an x minus 3. And, of course, you can adapt that to any other powers you have or any other factors that you have there. And then you go ahead and solve for the coefficients the same way we did here. And then you can replace that more complicated integrand with simpler terms, integrate using the power rule for antiderivatives or a natural log, depending on the power of the uh, denominator here and get your integrand. So thanks for watching and don't forget to hit subscribe and share, like, comment on our videos. Thank you.